Let's go to the book of Romans, chapter 7. Romans, chapter 7. And uh, today we will begin with verse 7. So Romans, chapter 7, and beginning at verse 7. It says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid, but sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would that, I, that do I not, but what I hate that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now then, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law. That when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind... I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. I'll bring a message today on the subject of, is the law evil? Is the law evil? We'll by no means uh, get through this entire <coughs> passage that I've read, uh, but... Uh, in the exposition of this, there is much that can be covered, much that can be gleaned, and indeed, uh, much that we can learn from this passage of Scripture. You can call these questions that he asks, you can call them rhetorical if you want. Uh, I believe that's what they were. Uh, there, are, there are those who uh, suppose that... Paul, as he's writing, that uh, he was actually uh, he was actually into uh, some sort of uh, debate or question that was being asked by one of the Jews there at Rome. But I don't believe that's the case. I, I, I believe that um, these weren't really questions that people were asking him, but as he was writing under the inspiration of the Spirit. He was writing some questions down that uh, would come up as people read this epistle and as they considered the things he had to say. Uh, this is, uh, as you know, not the only question that, uh, that was asked. Uh, if you remember back in chapter 6 and verse 1, he said, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And the answer, of course, is God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? Uh, if you go on down to verse 15 of Romans chapter 6, he says, What then shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. If you go into chapter 7, in the first verse there, 
Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. Uh, and then, of course, you get into this passage where we're at, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. So these questions are intended for the reader uh, that in it, any kind of uh, uh, thought or uh, argument against what Paul is saying would come up, there's the answer. Uh, also, it could be that they're written to make you think a little bit deeper about these things and consider what the Holy Spirit has for us. And so, that's why I've entitled this, Is the Law Evil? If you recall in verses 5 and 6 of Romans chapter 7, uh, we'll just reread those. It says, For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Uh, in these two verses, verse 5, Paul is describing the effect of the law on himself and on each one of us. All of those who read this epistle could relate to this. Um, before conversion, uh, before the Lord saved you, this is where you were at. I was there, Paul says, and this is where you are. In those times, he and they, and us also, we were under the dominion of the law. But in verse 6, we read of that deliverance. Now, in this portion of the epistle, he illustrates the effects of the law on himself. And he begins to differentiate some things and really begin to cover some of the some of the deeper things about this. Uh, not only the effects of the law, but also the struggle, the internal struggle that we all face. And every child of God knows something about this struggle. If you don't know anything about this struggle and you have made profession of faith, you really need to check uh, and to examine yourselves to make your calling and election sure. This is very, very serious when we consider this internal struggle. And even though we have been given new life, and we're made a new creature, the old is still there. And there's this struggle that goes on, this daily battle that comes on. And so he begins this section with that question. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law sin? Is the law evil? Is the law the cause of sin? Is really where we're at with this. And what, what, what Paul is speaking of here in this chapter. Does the law so <coughs> produce sin that the fault is to be laid on? on the law itself. That's the question. That's the debate. This is what the, the Holy Spirit inspired him to write about here. And of course, the answer to that question is, God forbid. Let it not ever be thought that the law is to be blamed for sin. He says, I had not known sin but by the law. So, so far from being evil, the law is not the source of sin, but rather the only source of the knowledge of sin. And there is a difference. <coughs> Excuse me. By the law, by the way, he is speaking of the moral law of God. Remember the 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 the, the the book of Romans was written to a church that was uh, not just Jews and not just Gentiles. It was both. And uh, so 
while you could say, well, the Jews knew something about the Mosaic Law, they knew something about uh, the ceremonial laws, that's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about the moral law of God in whatever form it's to be found. And, uh, and, and, and we'll look at that here, some more here in just a moment. But then whenever he says there, I had not known sin but by the law, he doesn't mean that he discovered sin because of the law. He doesn't mean that he was, he would have been, he would have been sinless except the law of God was there. No, that's not what he means with this. He's talking about, he's talking about conviction. Conviction. Uh, and and, and what, he's, what he's referring to here is not the intellectual knowledge of sin. He's not talking about being a sinner because of the law. But what he's talking about is this conviction that he had, he was a lawbreaker and that he had broken God's law. Otherwise, he would have been in ignorance of the sins that he was doing. He would have known that they were wrong except for the law of God. Uh, we all come to that. Those of us who have been saved, we know what that's like. When you see yourself a sinner and hopeless because of Almighty God and, and His law, uh, and, 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 you, and you don't know where to go or what to do, and you, and you know that you're a sinner. That's conviction. The guilt and the filth that we find not in everybody else. There's no doubt, even when we were, even when we were without Christ, we could see the guilt and the filth. We could see the rubbish and the sin, sinfulness in everybody else. But because of the law, we begin to see it in and of ourselves. We see ourselves as sinners who have broken God's law, rebelling against God and His holiness. He says, For I had not known sin, but by the law. I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. And he begins to bring this down even further. Not just sin, as a blanket statement or as a, uh, a general statement, but he, he mentions this one, this lust. And he said, I would have even known that it was wrong except for the law. And we know this to be true because <coughs> desires, coveting, lust, those things reveal the hidden heart. In Exodus chapter 20, Verse 17, if you go back there to when the Ten Commandments were given, in this particular law, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 17, shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. It's telling that the Holy Spirit directed Paul to write about this particular commandment. If you go through the Ten Commandments, the other nine deal with visible behaviors. Uh, and so, uh, if you look there in Exodus chapter 20, you'll see what I mean. Uh, we're talking about stealing. We're talking about committing adultery. We're talking about killing, for instance. If you just start going backwards, you know that those things 
all deal with physical actions. But coveting deals with the heart. Uh, the other commandments are dealing with visible behavior, but this one moves in and gets real close. Uh, dealing with the character of the individual. Dealing with the intents, uh, desires, and lusts, and coveting. It's kind of interesting whenever you begin to read and study what, uh, what the, the way men have interpreted this and the way that sometimes it gets interpreted from the pulpits. Uh, the law itself does not forbid the accumulation of wealth or property. But what it does is it forbids the accumulation of property at the expense of someone else. Uh, desiring what belongs to someone else. The law does not read, thou shalt not covet or desire a house uh, or an ox or an ass or, or even a wife. Well, what it does read is thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox, thy neighbor's ass, th thy neighbor's wife, and so on and so forth nor anything that is thy neighbor's. It is indeed something that we are uh, very proud of in America and something that's made America great, and that is the right to property and private property. Uh, and so we have, we, and, and these things are, are God-given. Uh, and, and we find these even here in the book of Exodus chapter 20. Uh, uh, going back even to thou shalt not steal. We've got property. It doesn't belong to someone else. Uh, and, and, and whenever you get into this coveting, it is uh, our duty, our responsibility as people of God and people uh, in this country. We, we have these rights to acquire what we can. But if we're going to do it right, we, we must do it honestly for the glory of God. We've got to do it within our means. Uh, it's not a good thing for a man to, to uh, exist from day to day without a plan, without work, uh, to uh, not accumulate anything, but rather sit back and and, 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 and covet what other people have. If you want it, earn it. Um, and uh, indeed, we ought to live from year to year, forecasting the future, making plans, and, uh, and, 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 and doing those things so that we can build up in order to give God the glory. Uh, covetousness is indeed the opposite of do, doing for the glory of God. Uh, it's the opposite of simply improving one's condition. Uh, it's the opposite of need. All about desire. It's born of laziness, discontent, envy. It's born of love of self and love of show and even power for the person who wants those things and desires those things and yea, even sometimes we'll go out and get them. And how easy it is that we fall into covetousness. I'm sure that as we reflect on these things that I've just said and about the, the idea behind it, we can, all, we can all think back to something or some time that we have broken that very commandment. How easy it is for us to fall into it, even in our own country. Though there be many, many years separating us from where Paul was writing to, to the Romans, and many, many more years separating us from when the commandments were given there on Mount Sinai, we are not exempt from these things. And no doubt we can relate to and maybe shamefully admit that we have also struggled with this very law. In fact, 
if you begin to pay attention and you watch the commercials on TV, the advertisements that come out, uh, many of them are about the desire, about the coveting, about the envy. Many of the reality shows uh, and, and even some of the other kinds of shows on TV are about that sort of thing. And then we put ourselves in worse shape because we've got social media. And we begin to look, and you've got to be careful because it's an easy trap to fall into. You begin to look and see what pictures other people have posted. And you begin to look and see what kind of houses they've got or what kind of family they've got. Even. And you begin to desire those things. To covet what others have. You might say, well, preacher, that's just a small thing. But indeed, it's not a small thing. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have inspired Paul to write the way he did. In the book of James chapter 2, James chapter number 2, and verse 10, James 2 and verse 10, it says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. We all have broken God's law some way or another. Covetousness is that one that really strikes at the heart. It's where we first learn in the Scriptures that sin is not just an outward thing. That it really, it, it comes from the heart. It, come, it comes from within. Jesus brought it out in uh, um, many different ways, but in Matthew chapter 15 and verse 19, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Verse 20 says, These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Jesus strikes at this and he says, You know, you Pharisees, you've, you've done a great job of try, trying to clean up the outward. But here's the reality. What, 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 what about what's going on inside? And, you know, he brings these things up. Which is what we were taught in the book of Exodus to begin with. And then Paul, in writing there in Romans chapter 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law said, Thou shalt not covet. Though the law is not sinful, it does arouse sinfulness. The knowledge of it, the, the conviction of it. But the law is not the answer. The law condemns. The law, is, as we brought out last, last week, there is no hope to be found within the law. So as we stand there and we examine ourselves in the light of God's law, we find ourselves to be sinners without hope on the road to an eternal hell. But that's not the end, is it? Because in Galatians chapter 3, Galatians chapter 3, be in verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith come, 
we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. You see, when we see our sinfulness in the light of God's law and understand that we've broken God's law, that we are rebelling against Almighty God, realizing, beloved, that there is no hope to be found within ourselves nor within the law, the law points to Christ. Because we look at it and we say, where's the, what, 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 what can we do? There's nothing that I can do. I've done broken God's law. I'm, I'm a sinner and need of Savior. And there's only one place to turn, and that is to Jesus Christ. You see, the law teaches us of our sinfulness, but the law also points us to Christ as the only hope that we have. Those who go to the law for, uh, for, 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 for uh, the ability to be saved or to go there to get to heaven, they, they haven't yet seen how wicked and sinful they really are. But when we understand these things by the grace of Almighty God, the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we begin to see something that we may not have noticed before. And that is, that is that uh, we are indeed wicked, sinful creatures, and that Christ is our only hope. You see, and this applies to not only the Jew, but also the Gentile. The Jews had grown up learning the law of God and reading the Old Testament. But the Gentiles had that law written in their hearts. Jew or Gentile, there's only one hope, and that is Christ. The law is not evil. In fact, uh, as we begin to read on there in Romans chapter 7, we find that he uh, differentiates between the the law being spiritual, uh, verse 14. And then if you go on down to uh, verse 22, he said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. That old flesh wants to obey and serve sin. But now we wish to delight in the law of God. Not that there is anything that is there to hope in. Not that there's any way to heaven to be found in the law. But we love the law of God now because uh, it's a reflection of God's holiness. We love the law of God now because because the Lord has done so much for us and now we serve Him and we, get, we give Him the glory by obeying His Word. Uh, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. No, the law is not evil. Far from it. Uh, we find that God has given us the law of God and, uh, and it's there for a reason. And we are to obey it. We're to do that which is right, pleasing in God's sight. And so, uh, Lord willing, next, next week we'll kind of look further into this subject. Praise God for His law. But praise God more than that for His grace. His mercy, His love for Jesus Christ who came into this world, never broke, not even, not even one of the commandments of God, lived a perfect life and died, not for sins of Himself, but for the sins of His people. He took upon Himself 
our sins, your sins, my sins, and laid upon us, gave to us His righteousness. Praise God for these things. Brother Ray, would you dismiss us in prayer? Father, thank you for this time to...